You are entering into a story this morning, a story of a garden. Perhaps you do not realize it, but the overarching narrative of the entire Bible is that of a garden. Think about it. The Bible opens in a garden, Genesis 1, 2, and 3. The Bible closes in a garden, Revelation 21 and 22. Right in the middle of the Bible, there's another garden. It's the garden that Jesus enters into. It's the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is betrayed in a garden. He's beaten in a garden. He's arrested in a garden. He's taken out of that garden. He's crucified. He's brought back to a garden, placed into a garden tomb, and he's resurrected from a garden. The theme of the entire relationship of God with man happens in a garden. In fact, the entire story of Easter is an invitation back to the garden. But you can't understand the depth of the invitation until you understand why man was rejected, was thrown out of the garden. We're no longer in the garden. That's not news to any of us. This is not paradise. Something has gone terribly wrong. We're no longer in the garden. The question is why? What is what has happened? Well, we learned a lot about this last week. You're entering into the middle of a story. If you were not here last week, I can bring you up to speed pretty quickly. Last week, we talked about the creation story, the first garden. In the first two chapters of the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, we learned that God made this world, and he made it in such a way as for us as humanity to enjoy. But then something terribly went wrong. In Genesis chapter 3, theologians call it the fall. Adam and Eve sinned against God. God is a righteous God, a holy God. He cannot tolerate sin, and therefore man was cast out of the garden. But this is not just Adam and Eve's story. This is our story, because Scripture tells us that now we are separated from God, that no matter what we do, we're not good enough to be in the presence of God. Now, most of humanity today has a problem with that. We have this propensity to think that we are actually better than we really are, even in the eyes of God. The service opened with an few passages of Scripture. If you miss them, let me read them to you. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? In other words, our heart can't be trusted. It might tell us that we're good, but it's desperately sick. We can't trust our hearts. And then we read in Isaiah 64, 6, we have all become like one who's unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. Now you might be thinking, well, I know that we do good, that man, humankind does good. Oh, I'm not saying that we aren't capable of doing good in comparison to one another. But that goodness, no matter how good it is, does not bring us any closer to God or an invitation back to the garden. Instead, even our best efforts, God says, kind of like a polluted garment. Romans 3.10 says, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. No one does good, not even one. Are you starting to see the story unfold? Sin has separated us from the garden, and now none of us will ever be worthy to walk in the garden of God. But there is one who is worthy to walk in the garden of God on our behalf. There is one who has come to restore that which is lost. That's the story that we're going to tell today. It's a story of great victory that the church has been dependent upon since its inception. I want you to imagine a moment 
when Christianity was not open, but rather Christians were persecuted, walking along some dusty road between two villages, a man comes up to another man and he thinks he recognizes him. Perhaps he's a brother in Christ. And so he says somewhat under his breath, he is risen. And he's waiting for the response. It's become almost liturgical now for us when we say that. We respond as a congregation in full affirmation, he is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. You see, that is the story we're going to tell this morning. The grave is a reality because of the fall. It's a reality now not only to Adam and Eve, but all of their children. That first grave opened up shortly after their sin. Their life would now be shorter, expelled from the garden. Death was coming. This has impacted all of humanity throughout all of the generations. This is not just their story. This is our story. We are separated from God, no longer worthy to walk in his garden, destined for the grave. But God's story does not end here. God's story does not end in a garden. God's story continues in a garden. Of all the gospel writers in the New Testament, it's John that continues the narrative of the garden. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open to the very first chapter of John, John chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, there's one close to you in the pew back. John is the fourth book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We also have page numbers on the screens behind me. John is going to take you and lead you out of the first garden, the Garden of Eden, and he's going to lead you into another garden. Now notice how John chapter 1, verse 1 begins. Just a few of the words. In the beginning. Now stop, immediately think, where is your mind leading you? Just those few words. In the beginning. The beginning. You know, those are the very first words of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1. Where is John leading us? He's leading us back to that garden. He wants us to connect the story of the garden in the Garden of Eden to the gardens that he is about to lead us through in his gospel. It's not far from there that he leads us to the Garden of Gethsemane the garden where Jesus is betrayed, where he's beaten, where he is arrested, where he's taken away to be crucified. You know, as Christians, we talk an awful lot about the cross. We have them in our worship centers. We have them on our buildings. We wear them as jewelry. Even those who are not necessarily believers embrace the image of the cross but I'm struck by the reality that many times people don't understand exactly what happened on the cross. You see, before you can understand what happened at Easter, you really have to have an understanding of what happens on the cross. John takes us to the cross of Christ, but exactly what happened? I want to pull you out of John for a moment just to have you look at another passage. You don't have to turn there. It's going to be on the screens. It's from the book of Romans. And we learn the impact of the cross on our lives. Follow along. We are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement. There is the connection to the cross. It was a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. 
it was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Now we see the connection to the cross, but then we have a commentary on what the cross does for us. A few definitions of some words in this passage would help. First word is that word gift, which is found in the first part of the verse. Think about a gift for a moment. You don't pay for a gift. When someone gives you a gift, they're not expecting a payment. It's given freely. That's the concept of a gift. That's the definition of a gift. Would you notice the passage again? We are now justified by His grace as a gift. This is something God is giving freely. There's another word embedded in here. I mentioned it a moment ago. It's the sacrifice of atonement. Now it's important for us to understand what is this idea of an atonement. When Jesus went to the cross, he was making a sacrifice of atonement on our behalf. The word atonement actually can be defined in two parts. First, it's the appeasing of the wrath of an offended person. Christ offends, or rather, uh, Christ appeases the offense that we have caused before God because of our sin. What is outpouring now to us is his wrath, his separation from us. What is Christ doing? He's appeasing that. But notice the second half of that definition. We're being reconciled. Jesus then becomes the bridge. He's the reconciler to God. Go back to the passage again. We are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood. Do you see this, that God is the one who is doing this? He is presenting his son. God is the one who sees our separation from him. And yet God is moving towards us. And what is he doing? He's justifying us. That word justification or to justify means to be declared righteous. It's a legal term. It's the idea that the judge now stamps over your case file righteous, no longer condemned. And then what do we see as the method? Well, the text tells us we are justified by faith in Christ. And how is that faith given to us? There's a word. You cannot miss it in this passage. It's the word grace. God offers his son to you to be received in faith as a gift. And that gift is received through grace, the unmerited favor of God for you. That's the cross. That's what happens at the cross. You see, we're not just people who celebrate Easter. We are people who celebrate the entire Passion Week. All that is leading up, we celebrate the entire life of Christ. Why was Christ able to make an appeasement, an atonement before God? Because he led a perfect life, something we could not do. He was worthy to walk in the garden of God, and only he was worthy than to take our sins upon himself on that cross. Scripture compares the Garden of Eden with the garden experience of Jesus. Listen to this. Therefore, just as one man's trespass, that was Adam, led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness, that's Jesus, leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedient, that's Adam, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, pointing back to Christ, the many will be made righteous. Now you might be thinking, well that all sounds great, but how do we know that it's true? How do we know that this is really how God 
operates. I mean, if you think about it, the grave ha hangs in a balance here. If we are wrong and we go to our grave following after a Christ to proclaim something he's not able to fulfill, then our destiny is dark. How do we know this is true? Well, let's return to the story of the garden. Let's return to the story of John. John takes us from that garden of Gethsemane to a garden tomb. We find this in John chapter 19. So you're in the book of John. Just turn over to chapter 19. And we're going to pick up the story in verse 38. The story that we're going to read is the story after the cross. The cross has already taken place. Now what? Well, we read in verse 38. After these things, what things? The cross. Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. And so here's this man who's wanting to take Jesus off the cross and give him a proper burial. Verse 39, Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in, the, in linen cloth with the spices, as is the burial custom of Jews. Now, listen carefully what John says next. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb. And in that tomb, no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, celebration, and since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. It was a hasty burial. And now we come to Easter morning. Chapter 20, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. I love the phrase taken away. If you read this in the original, it literally has the idea of just being tossed aside as if someone with great strength just tossed it aside into the garden. She realized this when she comes upon the tomb, that it had been breached, it had been opened, and it frightens her. She runs back to the disciples. It was Peter and John who ran towards the garden that morning, and they ran into the tomb, and what they had feared the most became reality. The body was missing. Now, their first thought was that someone had stolen the body, and so they leave Mary there, and they go back to the disciples. That's where we pick up the story. Drop down to verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. She had not looked in yet. And she saw something the disciples did not see. She saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And I love this allusion back to the garden. The story continues in this motif, supposing him to be the gardener. She said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And then Jesus says something to her. He calls her by name. He says, Mary. And with that, she knows. It's the Lord. She turns to cling to him. Mary. 
Do you realize that Jesus continues to do this with all of his disciples all throughout the ages? He calls you by name. You're not just one among the masses. He reaches into your life and he calls you by name. On the cross, he calls you and he calls you knowing all of you, knowing all that you have done, all that you would do, and yet he calls you by name. It changed the direction of her life, and she proclaims, I have seen the Lord. In other words, I have seen him alive. Someone did not just steal his body. He has been risen from the dead. I've seen him, and she proclaims that he's alive. Years ago, I had a friend who had a young son. He's now grown, and he's a man now, but when he was just a little boy, he had come home from a carnival, and he had received a prize that every parent hopes their children would not receive, that goldfish in that little bag. <laughs> I've had a number of those goldfish. My children have had those, you know, and they bring them home, and you know, they usually have a rough night at the carnival sloshing around in that bag and then thrown around at the bottom of the car. And by the time they get home, they've got some brain damage or something. And they don't quite make it through the night because somewhere in the morning they're listing to the side and rising to the top of the... <laughs> you all been there. Well, he did that and brought his little boy home and they carefully dumped the fish into a nice little fish bowl and somewhere in the night... That poor little fish appeared to have perished. So his son woke up, and there his fish is floating on top of the bowl, and he goes into his father's room and says, my fish is dead. And his father does what all brave father does. It's time to give this fish a proper burial. <laughs> Take him and flush him down the toilet. And so his little boy walks, bowl in hand, down the hallway, can you picture it? <laughs> Dumps the little fish into the toilet bowl and something happens to revive the fish because the fish starts swimming around in the toilet. <laughs> and he runs down the hall to his father and he proclaims, he's alive, he's alive, you gotta come see him, he's alive. You see, that's the enthusiasm when something goes from death to life. He's alive. That's what Mary was saying. There was a connection here from this garden to the first garden because this is our story. And because Christ has been raised, we will be raised, and it solidifies all that he has done on the cross. In fact, let me just show this to you in Scripture. 1 Corinthians says this, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead. For as by a man came death, who's that? Adam. By a man has come also the resurrection of the dead, Jesus. For as in Adam all died, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Have you been made alive? I mean, that's the question that comes screaming at us out of the text. Have you been made alive? You see, it's one thing just to understand the facts and to know the story and to hear about the cross and to celebrate Easter. We can do that for years. But have you made the connection? Have you been made alive? You say, well, how do I, how do, I do that? Well, it goes back to that tree. Do you realize that the tree of life, which is mentioned in Genesis, we see again in Revelation, and its leaves spring forth, bring healing to the nations. There's an allusion to that tree outside of the garden of Gethsemane. It's often referred to as the mercy tree the tree upon which Jesus died. 
the tree upon which he took our sins upon himself. And now the scriptures tell us that if by faith we believe in him, his righteousness is now accounted to us and we are welcomed back to the garden. Say, how do I apply this to myself? Well, you follow what the scriptures tell us. It starts by acknowledging you understand your position before God, that we belong expelled from the first garden, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and now we, in our own merit, are no longer worthy to enter back. But if we believe in Jesus, we no longer are condemned. That's what the scriptures say. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And so what does God invite you to do? To believe in Jesus Christ. And then the follow-up of belief is the idea that you repent and you continue in faith in him. Repent and turn back that your sins might be blotted out. You see, it's the start of our relationship it's through belief, but it's the continue of our relationship of walking after him as his disciple. Have you been made alive? You know, well, how do I do this? You simply proclaim it to your God who calls you by your name. There are no special words. There's no special prayers. You might have grown up in a, in a church scenario that everything is written out for you and the prayers are all prescribed for you and they tell you when to stand and when to sit and when you've done your service, you go out and you live your life. God says, no. Just call to me. I know you by name. I know your voice. I am listening. I'd be more than glad this morning to just simply lead you in a prayer to help you understand that. And in a moment, I'll do that. But I want you to know, for those of you who have proclaimed the name of Christ, I understand that today is the extension of the first day you called on his name. It's the extension of celebration, of being reminded you are made new in Christ because he has risen from the dead. And this is a day of celebration, and you'll have your opportunity to celebrate. We're ending our service today celebrating that which we know to be true and personal in our lives that our Lord is alive. But if this is your first understanding of what it means to be made alive, please know there will be pastors down front after our service to speak to you. We have a gift that we'd like to give to you. It's a Bible as well as some information on what it means to follow after Christ. It's free of charge. Just come down and we'd be more than glad to pray with you to give you that gift. That's available after the service. Well, let's go to prayer. If you have never invited Christ into your life, I implore you to do that today. You do not know what your life will bring in the next few moments Reach out to him now. He knows your name. Father God, I thank you for those who are right now being drawn to you by your spirit and you're listening to their voice. If you're calling to him, perhaps you would start by simply saying in agreement, yes, Lord, I have sinned. I have fallen far from you. Perhaps you're sensing that 
and the weight of guilt and remorse is before you, and you're wondering if God could ever imagine to receive you, the answer is yes. There is level ground at the cross. We have all sinned and fallen short of his glory. We all come to him. He hears you. Perhaps you would say something like, I believe in you. I embrace you. I proclaim you. I have a desire to walk after you. He hears you. And as you express that true and genuine faith in repentance, turning around, now seeking to follow after him, you make a proclamation that your faith is real and genuine. He receives you. He calls you by name. And you become a child of God. Father, I pray for those who are at this moment in their own way crying out to you. And we do pray that many hearts would be bent towards the call to follow Jesus Christ. Thank you for receiving us, for knowing us, for revealing yourself to us. For those of us who have walked with you for many years, we once again proclaim in celebration that we serve a risen Christ. And we celebrate that Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, has defeated sin and death and is the champion that goes before us. Thank you for welcoming us back into the garden. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This has been a message from The Chapel in Akron, Ohio. For more information about The Chapel or to listen to more of these types of life-applicable messages, please go to our website at thechapel.life.